Welcome to MedMark's webinar series. Today's presentation is titled, How to Effectively Evaluate Change and Incorporate Findings into Biocompatibility Testing and Justifications. I'm Kate Klaus, Senior Attorney in MedMark's Risk Management Department. On behalf of MedMark and today's presenter, Thor Rollins, thank you for joining us. Thor Rollins is a certified microbiologist specializing in the selection and conduct of in vitro and in vivo biocompatibility tests. He frequently speaks on biocompatibility related topics through Nelson Labs external seminars, webinars, and trade shows. He is a participating member on various Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation and ISO committees and plays an active role alongside the FDA and regulatory committees, developing standards, discussing biocompatibility biocompatibility methods and voting on changes to these standards. As one of a select group of experts in the industry, Thor's participation on the committees offers him insight on industry changes and helps him prepare clients for changes in testing. And with that, I am pleased to turn things over to Thor. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having me today. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Um, I know that Sometimes there might be some webinar fatigue right now uh, with, with the COVID, but man, I, I do love talking about these, these um, issues and biocompatibility and, and uh, things that impact all these medical device companies. So for me, I, I truly enjoy these opportunities to kind of go through some, some thought process and learning that we've done with, with our ability to uh, work with many different customers and many different regulatory authorities. Um, today's uh, topic is about you know, the testing that's associated or the risk management process with changing a medical device. I do wanna tell you that the things that we're gonna talk about today are things that we use all the time uh, when we deal with changes. These uh, submission or these kind of evaluations are then sometimes sent to the, the FDA or notified bodies or, or CFDA or around the world, JMHLW, for considerations. Um, and we'll kind of go through some of the tips and tricks that we use when we help our clients evaluate changes in medical devices. So that's what we're gonna to do today. And I love answering questions. So like was mentioned before, please put any questions in the chat. I'm happy to get through those as much as I can at the end of this. <clears throat> so the first thing that we're gonna to cover today is what constitutes a change. I, I do want to tell you that this is probably one of the biggest things that we deal with day to day. Uh, obviously, at Nelson Laboratories, we, we test a lot of devices that are new, uh, that are trying to get 510K or PMA or, or CE mark or whatever it may be. Um, but I would say the majority of the things that we evaluate are devices that are already in the market that are going through some type of change, um, some kind of a change in either materials or manufacturing process, sterilization, packaging, whatever it may be. And we have to evaluate the, the, the biocompatibility impact of that change and then do a risk uh, uh, management process and justify uh, either testing or non-testing and things like that. So that's what we're gonna go through today. And the first thing to always think about is what do we consider a change? Like what are you, what incorporates a change to you as a medical device that you should be considering for biocompatibility? So the first thing I always, say is why are you changing? Um, I always make fun of like uh, marketing departments when we look at changes because sometimes people want to change a, a device just like to change a color or they think they can sell more if they change something that's not really functional or beneficial to the patient. And I always, as a, as a risk assessor and as a biocompatibility expert, I, I kind of cringe because for me, any change should be a benefit to the patient. It shouldn't just be a change for the sake of change. Uh, because any change that you go through needs an evaluation. And I mean any change, because we need to see if a change is going to impact the patient. And so we're talking about a change in your packaging. Even your packaging configuration might have an impact that we have to look at. We've seen it happen. Um, sterilization changes are, could be huge. And there's a lot of that happening right now because we're seeing capacity issues when you start looking at radiation. Um, or And the, so they're looking at going from radiation to E-beam, for example, or maybe they're, they're playing around with x-ray um, or you know with EO, some of the issues that EO has been having. They're looking at, well, maybe we can use a radiation source. So this is something we're dealing with quite a bit now. And that's obviously things that impact biocompatibility. When you're switching from uh, gamma to E-beam, uh, from E-beam to X-ray, or even from EO to radiation or radiation to EO, 
all those can have an impact on your biocompatibility and your materials and, and you have to evaluate it. So packaging changes, sterilization changes, material changes with the supply, the, the, the supply shortages we have today, lots of people are looking for alternative uh, material suppliers that they can use. And obviously that needs to be a change evaluation. One thing I want to make sure everyone knows is that you can't just change from like a one polypropylene to another polypropylene or one silicone to another silicone and call it the same. They're, they're not the same. They use different stabilizers, they have different additives, even if it's the same like chain polymer. So all these things have to be evaluated and then looked at the risk to the biocompatibility of the patient. And so that's what we're gonna kind of talk about. So the second bullet point there is important. It says, if you change your device with the intent to significantly affect the safety or effectiveness of the device, more in-depth evaluation, including new 510K may be needed. That's directly from the FDA. So lots of times we make changes to a device that actually we assess, but that doesn't necessarily mean that needs to go through a new 510K. There needs to be some kind of safety assessment uh, to, uh, internally to evaluate that impact. But to know when to submit a new 510K is important because obviously then you're, you're talking to a different audience. You're, you're not just talking to maybe a, an auditor that's coming through, you're talking to a, a, a reviewer, a biocompatibility expert. So you might need to have a little bit more in-depth communication about those types of changes. So some of the changes we see, I talked a little bit about them, label changes, uh, believe it or not, even changing a label, we've seen impact on biocompatibility and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Packaging, like I talked about, materials, process changes, for biocompatibility, there's the two things that we care about most when we look at a device. It's the material that it's made up of and then any residuals from processing. Those two things are the two big things that we care about from biocompatibility. Me personally, most of the time, the materials are pretty safe. Uh, we've been using pretty much the same materials for a very long time. So it's not like we're seeing new materials come out that causes a high level risk. For me, the thing I'm mostly concerned about when I look at changes or even a full biocompatibility evaluation, it's the processes. Um, what are we leaving on these devices through the process that could be impacting our patients? So for me, the process is actually probably the thing I focus on more. When we see failures in biocompatibility, most of the time it has to do with process residuals and not in the materials themselves. The other thing that I see a lot of people do is either change or add colorants to an already approved device. This at a, a little while ago, this was actually a very big topic, so much so that the FDA did its own webinar on it. Um, if, you, if you want more information, I did a, a whole uh, webinar and also white paper on it. Um, it's kind of cooled down a little bit now because uh, not many people are, are coloring or changing colorants to uh, patient contacting portions of the devices. But if you are going to change a colorant uh, to a patient contacting portion, either directly or indirectly, it's definitely something you should know. The last one that lots of people come to that they don't think may be a big impact, but can be is location change, right? So you're moving manufacturing processes from one site to another site. We, uh, it's been about, uh, about eight years ago now, we had one of these happen at Nelson Labs. So one of our customers was moving in California, was moving their production facility literally down the street. So I think it was a mile and a half or so down the street. And they, they just used their same um, machine, um, you know, machines, and they used the same personnel. They, they didn't change. Supplies were all the same. They literally just picked up everything, moved it a mile and a half down the street to a bigger facility and set up shop again. So they called me up and they said, hey, Thor, we're changing these locations. It's a mile and a half away. We're not changing any processes, any people, anything like that do we need to repeat biocompatibility testing? And I said, not really. I mean, I don't see the risk in there. If I would do anything, I would do a cytotoxicity test, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, and just a, just a screen. Well, guess what happened, right? The cytotox came back positive on the device made in the new facility. So we hurried up and ran a device that was the last device that was made in the old facility, and uh, we ran them side by side. And the old facility device passed and the new facility device failed again. So now we're like, okay, we have a confirmation that something happened in the move. So the next step was we did some chemistry to evaluate what could have changed. What could be the difference between the old and new device? 
And the chemistry revealed one compound that was higher in the new device than, or even in the new device that wasn't in the old device. And we did some research, we found out that that compound was used uh, to manufacture surfboards. And so when we told the, the customer that, they said, our new neighbor manufactures surfboards. And so this compound somehow was getting into the, the AV or the HAV system and was getting into their mix somehow. So they put in some filters. Uh, I can't remember exactly everything they did, but they're able to exclude that source of compounds. And now the, the device passed again when they retested. So uh, most of the time people move and there's no impact to biocompatibility. Um, but just to go to show you that sometimes there's some surprises that you're not aware of. So that's why any change should do some, you need some kind of evaluation on that change. Okay, so the first step to any change is this risk assessment. And ISO 1093-1 has gone through some major uh, changes in the last few, like six or seven years. In 2018, they came out with a new, we came out with a new version. And in the new version, it was more heavily focused on a risk-based approach. So we're trying to get away from a checkbox testing mentality where you just go through and you do all the testing and don't actually think about your device's risks at all. We're, we're trying to force the industry into more of a risk-based approach where we're actually doing more revisions to Dash 1 now. So a new draft just came out last month. Uh, the new draft drastically ch uh, proposed changes to Dash 1 to make it more like uh, uh, the risk-based approach. Um, so we're, we're continually pushing that way. So first step of any change is always a risk assessment. The first question that we always ask when we have when someone contacts us about a change is, is the change impacting material that is contacting the body, either directly or indirectly? So just for those of you that may not know, when we talk about directly or indirectly, a piece of device that contacts the body directly would be something like um, a, a surgical tool, the end of the surgical tool, like a, a screwdriver or something. The end of it goes into the body, actually touches bone, uh, touches tissue. That's a direct contact. Indirect would be something like an IV bag, where the IV bag sits outside the patient. Um, so it's not directly contacting the tissue of the patient, but it's leaching chemicals from the plastic into the solution of the IV bag and then delivering those indirectly to the patient. So that's an indirect contact um, the, where the device, that the screwdriver is a direct tissue contact. Both of those are pretty much the same when it comes to toxicology. Chemistry get into the body, either if it's indirect or directly, doesn't matter. There are some endpoints that do matter like implantation and things like that. But for the most part, it's chemistry we're carried, we worry about for the majority of these uh, endpoints that we evaluate. So if you have a tool, a surgical, like a delivery device or a surgical tool that has a fluid path that runs saline solution or something, contrast solution, something through it, if you're changing a portion in the handle that has that fluid path, that's a patient contacting portion. So that means it's, it's more concerning than if you're changing, for example, the handle of the device that the, the surgeon holds onto. The surgeon's gloved, um, then that impact is less, that change is less than the fluid path or the, the distal end of the device that contacts the patient. So that's your first step to the uh, change assessment is that risk assessment. D does this change impact directly or indirectly to the body? Um, are you intending this change to improve clinical risks or outcomes? So do you have history that tells you that a piece is breaking off, for example, or uh, a surgeon's having a difficulty delivering a, a stent because of this. And so you're changing to increase the safety of the procedure or of the device itself. That helps when it comes to mitigating the risks because we're increasing the safety. So you have a safe, um, you have the ratio of, uh, of risks versus uh, safety or benefit. Um, so those are things to think about. Um, are there any intentional consequences to the changes? I talked about um, the label changes. We actually had a device, and I'm not sure why they did this, but they put the IFU of the device in the, the, cart, uh, the packaging of the device itself. So it was sitting in the packaging. Um, they went to change inks in the IFU, and they changed to a water-soluble ink. Um, there was some humidity happening during sterilization. The ink ran and got onto the device. It wasn't noticed and some of the devices were actually put on the market. So we had to evaluate the risk of, of the minute, uh, leaching of the ink. And so there are times that you have to think about even a label change. Can that label change impact um, you know, uh, 
part of the device that doesn't necessarily have patient contact, but now you have leaching of ink or other compounds from a non-patient contacting portion, either packaging or, or even a handle to the patient contacting portion. So these are things you want to kind of think about unintended consequences of the change. The last thing we're going to kind of talk through is once you go through this risk assessment, what testing can be do to mitigate these risks? Um, if you think there's a risk there, even if it's a small one, what can we do to try to mitigate and, and feel good about the risks? And there are some simple, easy tests we'll cover in a bit to kind of help you feel good about those. And there's some more expensive kind of long-term tests that help when you really have unknown risks associated with the change. So the first thing we wanna talk about is 14971. When you talk about any kind of risk assessment, 14971 is, is the most you know, applicable. In fact, the new 1093-1 draft is, is using more of 14971 directly. So we're starting to see more of a convergence of these two ISO standards. So in 14971, risk is the combination of the prob uh, probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. So when we want to look at risk for a medical device, these are the two things we look at. And, and by the way, I borrowed this slide from a friend of mine, um, um, Ed Rivardi from, um, um, from Metronic, because uh, I thought it was a good slide. But um, when we evaluate a risk assessment for a medical device, these are the two things we look at. We look at okay, the probability of something happening based off the, the, the change of the device, where it's happening, uh, patient contacting, indirect patient contacting, and then the severity of that harm. And this goes into the original ISO 1093-1 chart, where you start looking at, okay, even if it's patient contacting, what part of the body are we contacting? Um, are we contacting the surface, the, the skin of the, of the patient, or are we going into the vascular system or cerebral fluid? So that helps us understand the possibility of the severity of the harm. So we look at the probability based on the change, and then we look at the severity based on how the device is used. So those are the two inputs we always add to our risk assessments when you're looking at a change. The other thing that I want to throw up here is that, uh, so this is right out of the FDA's guidance document on how to use 1093-1. And it also has a risk-based approach. Um, and in this, uh, it, it spells out, I think it's a great formula on how to do your risk assessment. So your risk assessment begins with your materials. So we talked about that, what are your, what are your materials used for? That second part, the, material, the manufacturing process, like I said, those residuals are important. The clinical use of your device, blood contact, cerebral fluid, just skin. Um, and then you take all of those in and consider the risks. And then you either do the testing that you feel you need to do or evaluate appropriately to address those risks. This is the exact same formula that we use to evaluate a change. We look at, are we changing materials? Are we changing processes that can directly or indirectly contact the patient? How's the device used? Based on those three inputs, we make a conclusion about either do we feel like testing is needed to help us feel good about these changes, or do we feel good that we've mitigated any risks, or do we have risks that we need to mitigate, and can we justify it? So in a nutshell, that's kind of our approach to justifying a change in a medical device from a biocompatibility perspective. So first, to kind of wrap up this, our initial thoughts for a change. Is it patient contacting material, directly or indirectly? That's your first kind of question. Um, and if you don't know, then we may need to do a little bit of testing. For example, if you think the change is indirect, but maybe it could leach onto a direct contacting portion, then maybe we need to do just some screening tests to see if there's any risks. Are we doing material similarities? Um, and we'll kind of talk about some of the tests that can be done to show this. But I mentioned before, just because you're changing from a silicone to a silicone doesn't guarantee they're the same. And that's true. But there's some simple chemistry tests, not full extractable leachable testing, but some simple chemistry tests that we can use to help demonstrate similarities between materials. So if you're evaluating different materials for a change, let's say you want more supply for your medical device. And so you want different suppliers for the same material. We can actually look at different suppliers and tell you based on uh, some testing like FTIR or UV Viz, some of these other ones, gravimetric even, um, how similar uh, the devices, uh, the materials are to one another. And this might help you inform a, uh, what material to choose to help mitigate those risks up front. The other thing we're gonna talk about, and we'll have a whole slide on this that a lot of people don't even consider, it's the patient contacting surface percentage of the change. 
The concept here is, let's say your change is to a very small portion of an overall huge device. That impacts the patient is very, very small, right? Because the majority of the device is staying the same. So that means the risk is very, very small. It would have to be something super toxic to actually show up in the, in the patient's uh, toxicology. But if you're changing the majority of your device, now you're, you're basically having a new device and that impacts much bigger to, to the patient and to our risk assessment. So we'll kind of talk through some thought processes of that in a minute. First off, I wanted to kind of state though, when you're looking at materials, these are things that we really push for our clients. When you're setting up agreements with suppliers, try to get these things in place first. It's very important to have this information before you really jump into any kind of um, uh, you know, long-term biocompatibility plan. Because if you change a material, or even if you start to you know, want to use material for something else, and you're trying to do a risk assessment, if you don't have some of this information, it becomes difficult to make some kind of change. First off, you need to have manufacturer agreements with your suppliers. You must agree that they will not change anything. And I mean anything, just like I talked about you, if you're changing anything, it has to be a risk-based approach. If they're changing anything, they need to change, they need to inform you. A good story about this one is we had a client that was uh, having a, a manufacturer make glass for their device. Um, and this manufacturer was for a long time was making glass for them. And, and my customer would routinely send in some cytotoxicity tests from lot to lot just to kind of help some kind of uh, control uh, point for their materials. So every lot they got in from this raw glass, they would send us a small portion to do a routine cytotoxicity test on it. Um, and we were doing that for years. And for years, they would get zeros on this glass. Well, so all of a sudden, we started getting twos. Now, and I'll talk about cytotoxin in a minute, but twos isn't necessarily a failure. But if you go from a zero to two, it kind of makes you wonder what happened, right? So they reached out to their supplier and they said, hey, we're, we're doing cytotox on your, on your lots. And we've always had zeros. And now we're starting to see some cytotoxicity. Can you tell us what changed in your process? And if any of you have ever worked with suppliers before, you probably know the answer was nothing. We've changed nothing in our process. It's the same gloss we've been giving you for, you know, the last 10, 15 years. So they decided to do an audit just to kind of make sure. So they flew out there and, and sat down and went through the, the facility. And their hosts sent them up to the cell that was producing this, um, this glass and introduced them to the manager of the cell. And the manager kind of walked them through the process of making the glass and he said, we know this is going into a medical device and we know how important it is for you and for the patients. We, we take this very seriously. In fact, so seriously that we actually just started wearing gloves to make sure that we're even reducing the bio burden of your, of your device. This started making the heads turn a little bit. So they asked the question, well, what kind of gloves are you using now? And this, they said, well, these are the gloves right here. And they were latex gloves. They were latex powdered gloves. So they didn't change anything in the process, right? They were still using the same process to manufacture this glass, but that change in adding gloves, now latex particles were being added to this glass and latex is cytotoxic. Um, and so just enough of it was causing us to see some cytotoxicity on the test. So this goes to show you that they need to, your suppliers need to know that when you, you were dealing with medical devices, that small changes that may seem not important at all could have an impact to patient safety. If someone's late, uh, allergic to latex, that could actually make a, a big difference in, in how this device is used. Um, one thing we love as toxicologists is composition disclosures, right? Because if you tell us what's in the material, if I know what you're adding to the plastic, what stabilizers, what UV you know, uh, stabilizers, things like that, I can actually do better at predicting the safety of that device to the patient. Unfortunately, we can't usually get that information from suppliers. I love it when we do. Most of the time it's you know IP or whatever. I'm not sure why they think we can make a plastic just by knowing what's in it. But um, either way, sometimes, most of the time we can't get that, but I love trying to get it because it makes my job much easier. But along with that, you also need to know what possible residuals might be on their materials. Like we talked about before, it's not just about the material, it's about the residuals. And they may tell you it's silicone, and that's great. We know silicone is pretty safe, 
but what are they using during their manufacturing process? Are they cleaning it? Are they using a detergent that's cleaning? Things like that. We may we need to know what kind of residuals could be on that material that now are on your device. We can always get MSDSs or SDSs. Honestly, I hate them. They're not useless. I used to tell, say that they were useless. They're not, they're not useless, but they're not very helpful. In fact, they're not peer reviewed. We've found mistakes and in, in just incorrect data in them before. So um, sometimes people tell me, okay, you can do a biocomp risk assessment. Here's my MSDSs for my materials. And I'm gonna go, great, now we have to do more testing because I don't have enough information to, to mitigate risks, right? There are device master files that, that companies do. I, I always say New Seal here. I'm not paid by New Seal. I'm not a spokesperson of New Seal, but they do a great job on their silicone. They, they have master files uh, with the FDA on a lot of their med grade silicone. And a lot of those master files are testing that's done on different sterilized, uh, different sterilization endpoints. So they'll do testing on irradiated material and EO material. And, and now the FDA won't give that to you. You have to contact New Seal to get permission and, and get it from them. But if New Seal will give it to you and you can now feel more confident you have good data to help support um, the, the change of that material to that. So New Seal is not the only one that does that. There are a lot of uh, device manufacturers that have device master files. Just a little bit of warning though, not all master files are created equal. Uh, there's no like regulations on what needs to be included in a master file. So um, some of them like NUSIL will have great information with sterilization impacts. Others will just have a cytotoxicity test in them um, or maybe a cytotoxic sensitization irritation. So really ask what, you know, what's in the master file, what they did to, to, uh, in, you know, to justify it um, and line that up with what you need to mitigate the risks. Okay, this is where I talked about patient contacting surface area. This is another tool in your toolbox to, to evaluate the risk of a medical device change. This is table one out of 1093-12. Dash 12 is the sample preparation standard that we use as laboratories to extract your devices. So the concept is, is you give me a device, I need to test that device. Um, I can either do that by implanting it into an animal, but the majority of the time I I don't implant the device in an animal. What I do is I make like a chemical soup that represents that device. So I put it into some kind of liquid like uh, water or saline or oils, and I extract it um, to get that, that soup out. But the more volume I add, the less concentrated that soup becomes, right? So if you pour a lot of water in your soup, you start to not really taste the soup very well. Uh, it's the same idea with, with this extraction. The more volume we add of fluid, the less concentrated those chemicals become, where if I let less media, the more concentrated the, the, the chemistry is. So we need to standardize that. And that's what this chart does. It helps us standardize across the whole world how much media we add or fluid we add to extract um, your medical device. It's based off of surface area. There is some weight in there, but by large, especially in the FDA, surface area is the way to go. So for every like six centimeters squared per minute or six centimeters squared of surface area or three centimeters squared per surface area, I add one milliliter of fluid to extract my device. So if I have a device that's 120 centimeters squared, um, I add 20 mils if it's six centimeters squared per mil um, or 40 mils if I add three centimeters squared per mil. So that's kind of how this chart works. But there's also a little area of that chart that's very important that a lot of people miss. And it's right um, here at the top where it says that your extraction ratio is plus or minus 10%. Okay, right up there at the very top. This means that if you do a test with us at Nelson Laboratories and we calculate the surface area at 20 centimeters squared and you do another test somewhere else, I don't know why you would do that, but let's just say you do. Um, then they calculate the surface area at 19.4 centimeters squared. As long as we're within plus or minus 10% of one another, then we can use those, we can say those results are comparable. So that's the concept of this, um, this little box, but I use it to help us evaluate the risk of a surface area change. If you're changing less than 10%, of your surface area, of your patient contacting surface area of a medical device. So if it's a big delivery device that has huge handles on the uh, that, don't, that do not contact the patient, and then only the distal end contacts the patient, you, you have to look at the patient contacting surface area. If you're less than 10% changing that, 
then the risk of the patient is a lot less than if you're changing more. So if you start to change 10 to 50%, that starts to become a little bit more risky. We have to do a little bit more evaluations or testing, need more information. If it's over 50%, then you're basically doing a new device, right? So then you, you, you are kind of more stuck to doing your, your normal biocompatibility evaluations. So this is a good place to start to kind of help inform you on the potential risk to the patient. The concept there is if you're changing less than 10%, even if you test it all, we're probably not going to see an impact in the results because the majority of the device, 99 to 90% of the device is the same. So therefore, we're probably not going to even see a difference in the results because it's so diluted out. So we use that concept to help us mitigate the risk of a medical device. Now, let's say that you are changing portions of the patient contacting uh, of the device. It is greater than 10% or you're adding something you just don't have a lot of confidence in. Then we need to kind of think about what testing should we run to help us evaluate these changes. And I'm going to give you some of the tools that we used uh, based on the risk of the device. I'm not saying you need to run these. I'm not saying you can run any of them or all of them. It just depends on that initial risk assessment, how risky it is, how big of impact is the change. Then these, these are the tools that you can use to help mitigate and, and understand the risks. The first one is chemical characterization. Now, this is a hard word kind of to, to just use. So lots of people throw out chemical characterization as, uh, and some people look at that as extractable and leachable testing. There's a difference, okay? Even though they sometimes use interchangeably, they're not the same. Chemical characterization is really characterizing the chemistry of your device. That can be done through extractable and leachable testing, or it can be done through simple tests like FTIR, right, um, or, or DSC, um, or maybe you're just looking at metals. You're just changing a metal so you can look at ICPMS. That's still characterizing the chemistry of your materials, but it's not extractables and leachables. Extractable leachables are looking at all the extractables and leachables are coming off your device. Extractables are chemicals that come off under exhaustive extraction or ex elevated extraction conditions, like higher temperatures, more aggressive solvents. Leachables are chemistry that comes off under normal use conditions, like body temperature for you know four hours or whatever. So, but they they have a lot more information in extractable leachable testing. We get to try to identify and quantify every compound that's coming off your device um, to look at a toxicological evaluation. ENL is used when we're really concerned about the change. When there's not enough information to mitigate the risk, we need we feel like there's we need more information to really feel good about it. That's when we lean more on extractable leachables. If we have a smaller change, or if it's a change to a material that we feel really good about, we don't have as much risks, the simple more chemical uh, characterization is much more useful. So just to keep in mind that we have lots of tools when we start looking at changes, because we actually know more about what we're looking for with a change. It's usually a small part of the device or materials, so we can actually focus better than we can a brand new device that has many materials and unknowns associated with it. So to give you a little bit of uh, understanding about extractables and leachables, okay, so all chemistry can be broken down into two areas, organics and inorganics, okay? Organics has carbon, inorganics does not, or it's metals and simplistically it's metals and everything else. Um, so if you're changing a piece of a metal, like I talked about before, like if you're going from a stainless steel uh, to a different stainless steel, then maybe we can do an ICPMS and only look at metals because that's all we care about, be more focused. Um, where organics, we have to look at things like volatiles and semi-volatiles and non-volatile organic compounds. Not to get too much into chemistry here, because that's not the point of this discussion. If, if you want to talk more about chemistry, there, we have lots of discussions on chemistry. Um, but volatile compounds are things that are very uh, small molecular weight, which means they evaporate very quickly. Okay, Those tend to not be as big a risk um, and with changes, because you're not normally changing a volatile compound, maybe in a process change. But you know, most of the time, those are evaporated off or can be done with before they get to testing. It's the semi-volatile or non-volatile compounds that, that we deal more with. Those are the larger molecular weight compounds that stick around longer. Um, and so those are the ones that tend to be more uh, in, in impactful when you start looking at changes of medical devices. 
So this is kind of gets walks through the same concept, but it kind of helps you understand e &L looks at a wide net. So we throw out every single one of these. Uh, we look for metals, we look for metal oxides, we look at, for the volatiles and semi-volatiles and non-volatiles. So I have lots of clients to me that says, when I change the device, do I have to run extractables and leachables? You do not have to. If we can justify just running a portion of the full e &L, or maybe one of the other tests I mentioned before to mitigate the risk, that's what we tend to look for. Extractable and leachables are very expensive and long. So trying to stay away from automatically going to those tests. But extractable and leachable does give you a good chemistry uh, fingerprint of your device. So this is the results of an e &L study. As you can see, these are different compounds uh, that have come off uh, during the run. And so if we need to run e &L, we can take your old device and your new device and run extractable leachables side by side overlap these fingerprints. That helps us understand, like we did with the surfboard change, are we seeing anything new or are we seeing anything much bigger than it was before? And that helps us understand the risk of a medical device. So extractable leachables do have a, a part in changes. I actually really like using it, but it is relatively expensive and long. So we wanna be cautious when we use it. We wanna use it when we feel we need it and not just all the time. The other useful tool that I always recommend with a change is cytotoxicity. If you don't know what cytotoxicity is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it, but cytotox is the most sensitive biocompatibility test we have. So at Nelson Labs, we did a, a quick, or it wasn't quick, it was over 10 years. Uh, we did a, uh, just an overview of our failures. So anytime a test failed at Nelson Labs over a space of 10 years, we recorded it. And um, 90, 96% of the time, it was cytotoxicity, okay? So that means only 4% of your failures are gonna be anything else in biocompatibility. 96% of the time, at least for our data, it's gonna be cytotox that fails. So that means that it's a great screening tool. It's also the, the cheapest and quickest test we have. So the cheapest and quickest test happens to be the most sensitive. So it's great screening. You cannot just run this for biocomp and call it good. Um, you're because you have other risks you have to evaluate, but it's a great screening for, uh, for changes. So this is a dashboard for cytotoxicity. This is for Nelson. It might be a little bit different from other labs, but shouldn't be too different. Um, sample requirements is uh, how much material we need to run it. TAT is turnaround time. So as you can see, it's a very quick test. Uh, gives us results very quickly. We do see normal problems with cytotox as far as materials go though, like latex, like I mentioned before, that's also true with natural rubbers. A lot of metals are cytotoxic, like silver, copper, zinc. Um, so they're a good, they're a source. In fact, their cytotox is great to evaluate a color change because colorants use always has, usually always have a backbone of a metal. And so um, cytotox, if it's one of those metals that are cytotoxic, they would pick it up. Um, we can also run ICPMS to look for that metal backbone too. The only thing that we get into issues with cytotox is short curing times. <clears throat> so we call it the smell test. It, it's kind of funny. Have you ever opened up a, a device bag and you just smell this really heavy chemical smell? Well, if you can smell it, imagine how much of that's coming off in the uh, chemistry is coming off in the extract. So if you have an adhesive that isn't cured all the way, uh, you know, that even though the adhesive is probably safe if it's cured, if it's not cured all the way, we're probably gonna see issues. Um, that's the same for colorants, things like that. So just keep those in mind. Uh, those are things we do see issues with with cytotox. So we always call cytotox your best friend and worst enemy because it's the cheapest, quickest screening, but it's also the one that fails the most often. So really quickly, based just because of time, I'm gonna run quickly through how we run a cytotox test. Um, it's ran on L929 cells, which are mouse fibroblast cells. So they're very common cell line in, in the body. Um, we, it's an adhering cell line too, which means they attach the bottom of a plate, which we need for this type of cytotox test. And uh, what we do is we end up extracting your device in this media. So that, that red media you see up in the flasks, that's called minimal essential media or MEM. In fact, this particular cytotox test is called minimal essential media or MEM elution test. Um, so we extract in that, in that Kool-Aid looking solution. Don't drink it, it's not good to drink. Um, and that takes out all the chemistry off your medical device. That is, that's more water soluble, that is. 
Um, and then we take that chemistry and we put it onto these cells. So now all that soup of chemistry is now interacting with our these L929 cells and anything toxic will be brought into those cell lines. So now all we have to do is look at the cells after they've grown for a while to see what kind of impact those chemistry, the chemicals could have on the cell line itself. Then we score it. We score it from a zero to four. So, and it's based on the percentage of cell death. So, or, or impact. So as you can see, if it goes from no impact whatsoever to less than 20% of the cells are impacted, then between 20 and 50% of the cells is a three, between 50 and 70% is a, uh, sorry, a two, between 50 and 70% is a three, anything over 70% it's a four. Now there is other versions of cytotoxicity that are starting to be more common based on the standard, which um, is requiring more quantitative results. And those are things called like MTT or XTT or neutral red uptake and some other ones. They're actually ran almost identical to this, except instead of just looking at the cells, uh, which we'll see in a minute under a microscope, we use a stain to stain them and viable stains will, will keep the stain in. So regardless of the type of cytotoxicity test you run, um, all of them are very good screening tests. So this is the cell line. So this is what we want to see. This is a zero. Um, we want to see this great mosaic pattern of cells on the bottom of the plate. Um, you can see a little bit of reddish uh, in there. That's actually that neutral red stain that we, we can run um, to try to help us understand the quantification of the, the toxicity. And so that's a viable stain, which means healthy cells will kind of absorb that stain and, and then metabolize it. And so um, that we want to see that red. That's compared to this, which is a four. Now, as you can see, there's a pretty big difference between a zero and a four. In fact, I could probably teach all of you on this call um, how to score a zero and a four. The hard part of this test is when you start getting into those percentages, like between a two and a three, right? That takes, takes some skill. And that's why quantitative test is preferred because it kind of takes the, the technician skill out of it. Um, but this, um, even these things that look like cells here, are actually kind of like the skeleton of the cell left behind. So that's that's a, because this is latex, this is our positive control, and latex is a fixative, so it kind of burns that cell skeleton to the bottom of the plate. But this is the, the cytotoxicity test that we run to help as a screen for a potential uh, you know, change impact. To kind of get you a sense of how these cells change over time, this is actually these L929 cells dividing uh, within an extract of a device over eight hours. And this is what we want to see. We want to see them healthy, dividing, growing. Um, this means there's no impact from the chemistry of the medical device. If we see impact from the chemistry, then we'll see the cells kind of shrivel up, not start to grow or, or um, you know, live, even die. Those are things we look for over time to help us score the, the cells. Um, this is one of my favorite movies. I watch it over the holidays all the time. If you'd like a, a, this video sent to you, just email me. I'll be happy to send it to you so you can you know, impress your friends at parties. Okay, so as the concept goes, we did our initial risk assessment. Um, based on the risk of the change, we then decide what testing we need to run to mitigate those risks. Uh, can we be more focused? Do we have to be more general? Now that we've done our testing and got our results, the one thing you need to do is make a report. And this is like telling a story. This is the thing I see most people just forget about. They'll say, oh, we changed this silicone to this silicone. We did a cytotoxicity test, it scored. We'll put the cytotox uh, in, the, in the master file, and call it good, right? Or the device history file and call it good. There's no story there. There's no kind of discussion of why you're doing it, your initial risk assessment, uh, the, and then at the end, why you feel like the risk, the change is, is, is fine, right? There, you need to tell the story. Um, and so doing an initial risk assessment written down on your approach and your, your evaluations, and then writing a report at the end as bookends is so important because 10 years from now, when someone gets audited on this and you're not around or you forgot because you've moved on, trying to understand why you felt like this change was is, is okay might be difficult without that story. So please, and as an FDA reviewer, I can tell you, they don't read minds very well. So you need to walk them through the whole thing in order to really help them be on your side. So we call this a biological evaluation report. We call this, regardless if you're doing a brand new device or if you change, we still call it a biological evaluation report. 
This is out of the FDA guidance document as how one of you can do how you can do a biological evaluation report. It's it's not bad, but it's not my favorite either. I, I, I don't really necessarily like just a table with rationale. I don't think it tells a story as well. I think it can be up for interpretation. Um, so I, we actually like to write a report. Um, so that's my recommendation for you guys if you want to do this. Uh, this is our table of contents for our BERs. Um, so you can kind of go through, but the background of why you're changing or why you're doing this because of the change, the purpose, you still want a device description and categorization because like I said, those are part of your risk assessment. How the device is used goes into why you think it's a, a impact or not of the change. Then the assessment, you're talking about the materials that you're using, uh, what biocompatibility tests you performed, were there particulates generated that, that could have been a, an impact from the change. Um, if you did any chemistry, what that talks risk assessment looks like, um, then the material change risk assessment from like a, a implantation standpoint or whatever, and then your conclusion. It tells the whole story so you can actually give that to a reviewer, an auditor, or even internally to help justify your, your thought process and then the results. The conclusion is based on the testing results and information summarized in this report, the change or the device is biocompatible and meets the requirements of, and that should be 2018 now, um, medical devices part one. Okay, so I wanted to leave at least 15 minutes. It looks like we have about 14 minutes left uh, for questions. That's my favorite part of these presentations. I wanna make sure we get your specific things answered. So please, um, for those of you who've already gave questions, thank you. For those of you who have not, please send them over. I'd love to answer them now. Thank you. Catherine, I think you're on mute. Hey, your sound's not coming in. Oh, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, we do have a few questions for you. Um, first, do all changes need to be assessed or only truly impactful changes? And how would you determine the difference? Yeah, so kind of like I talked about in the presentation, any change should be assessed. That doesn't mean every change needs to be addressed, right? So like we need to look at the impact of that change. And most of that has to do with, is it directly or indirectly uh, part of the patient contacting, the surface area impact of the change? Um, and then what information do you have about the change itself? Like are you changing materials? What information do you have on the new material? Um, and, and that helps you inform about um, if you need to actually evaluate the, the change or uh, you know do any kind of assessment. So then based off that, then the testing might need to be done or not. But yes, every single change at least needs to be thought through from an evaluation process. Okay. Um, next question, are there any special considerations for air pathway devices? Yeah, actually, this is a great example. Thank you for whoever brought that up. So there's a whole other ISO safety assessment, 18562, ISO 18562 for gas path devices. In them, they, they actually lay out different testing that may need to be done. But when you look at gas path changes, what we're mostly concerned about are particulates and volatile organic compounds. Like I talked about before, sometimes, most of the time, volatile compounds are not that concerning because they evaporate off. One of the exceptions is if you're breathing in that change, right? Because then that is volatile, it's evaporating into the gas path. So when we start to look at those types of changes, we may be able to focus our chemistry more onto the volatiles and maybe some lighter semi-volatiles and not worry about some of the other ones um, to, to mitigate it. The other concepts are the same, the percentage of surface area, the materials assessment, things like that. But we could probably focus our, our testing if we feel like we need it more for the impact of a gas path device. We have a sterilization question. If there's a change made to a sterilization method, do they need to evaluate the sterile and constituents? Yeah, so like I said in the presentation, we're seeing more and more of these changes now that uh, the market is starting to feel some restrictions on different sterilization methods. Um, and I can tell you from right here, EO is actually one of the least impactful from a biocompatibility standpoint, which sounds weird because everybody thinks about EO as probably being a dangerous gas, and it is because it wouldn't be a good sterilant unless it, you know, kill things. But the residual impact of materials from EO is very minimal. So really all we're cared about is residuals EO, which we, we do part of the validation. But radiation has a huge impact in materials. I've seen materials 
be toxic before radiation and then non-toxic afterwards because it's secured up cross-linking and made leachable less. And then I've seen the other way around where it's made it more brittle and actually impacted the, the toxicity. So um, we do have to think about all the impact from the sterilization. If you're doing hydrogen peroxide, for example, we have to look at the impact of hydrogen peroxide residuals on uh, from the device. So any change of sterilization is a huge evaluation that needs to be done. Um, and, and that's something that we probably need to do some kind of testing to, to get to the point. But we're not necessarily all extractable leachables. A lot of times we can look at residuals or we can do some FDIR to compare it, things like that. But yes, it's a huge uh, potential change that we have to go through. Uh, the next question we have is with regard to an injection molded permanent implant. How would you approach a change to the binder that's used in the molding process itself? Um, the binder is supposed to be gone after the process is completed. Yeah, yeah, we get this all the time. So once again, I'm glad to whoever asked that question is thinking about processing because some people would be like, hey, the material's not changing at all. There's no risk. But remember, we're, if we're changing a binder, uh, then that binder, even if it's supposed to be gone, may not be gone. And now we're having residual binder there that we have to be um, you know, concerned about. What we would do is actually ask for the binder chemical information. And so what we would then look at that and we would identify what chemistry technique is the most useful to be able to actually prove that that binder is not on the device. Then we would ask for at least three of your medical devices, um, take them and extract them and then run them through that chemical technique. It could be non-volatile um, or it could be, you know, something else, UV vis potentially, um, to see if we detect any of that binder. And, and then we can actually have proof that that binder is gone because even though it's supposed to be, most of the time it is, but sometimes we have seen it there and we just wanna be able to have proof. Then you use that chemistry to help justify that the, the change is sufficient because we could not detect any binder. So therefore it's not on the medical device. Okay. Um, the next scenario is a little bit more complicated. Uh, it is asking, can you use biocompatibility testing on two different products made of different materials that are manufactured slightly differently, and then use those results to support biocompatibility of a third new device that shares the same materials used in the first two devices and is manufactured similarly? So it might sound complicated, but the, the answer is actually pretty easy. Yes. In fact, um, one of the things that frustrates me a little bit in our industry is very large medical device companies with lots of resources um, do a really good job of generating databases where they take medical devices, either A, B, C, D, they run them through biocompatibility tests, they keep track of what materials and processes are used in those, and they put it in the database. So when an engineer is going to make a new device, they'll go through that database and they'll look, okay, we've used this material before in, this, in the same type of use. We've used this in the same processing. I have biocompatibility data already that I can use to justify my biocompatibility. And I've helped make these databases for companies so I know they have them and they use them all the time to get out of doing very large testing, right? But then you have like these smaller mid-sized companies that don't have the hundreds of devices on the market or the resources to do this. And they're stuck repeating biocomp every single time, even though I've tested the same stainless steel millions of times in my 20 year career. So um, if you have the opportunity to start developing a database please do so. But remember, it's not just the materials. You, you can't just say, I tested silicone here. I'm using the same silicone there. I tested polypropylene in the other device. I'm, I'm using that. You have to think about the processing too, because that's just as important. But if you can keep track of both materials and processes in a database to be able to use on new devices, yeah, we will leverage that all the time when we do our risk assessments. Okay. The next question, uh, it's really two questions that are somewhat related. Um, what is the most common issue that is seen in biocompatibility testing uh, when it arises from changes to the medical device design? And relatedly, is there specific language that FDA prefers when you are trying to demonstrate safety? Actually, they're very, very similar. So the biggest issue that we see, and I kind of mentioned to it, is people will make um, a change to a device and they'll do a cytotox test or something like that. And they'll throw the report in and say, done. Um, 
And that's the biggest impact that I've seen to changes um, from a, a medical device manufacturer is that no one's taking the time to really walk through the story of why you're doing the change, what risk assessment was done, what's the results of the test and why those results m mitigate risks, and then the conclusion. And from an FDA perspective, that's what they want. I, I can tell you, I have lots of friends that are reviewers. They, It's hard to be an FDA reviewer. You're, you, everything's on your shoulders. The safety of this device is on your shoulders. A lot of these people don't have a lot of industry experience. And so they're given just a, a description, not even a description sometimes, not even a picture of a device. And they say they passed cytotox test, so therefore it's safe or this change. Like you have to give the reviewer more. You have to help them, right? So walk them through the story. Pretend that they don't even know what a medical device is and really walk them through the whole thing and why you're doing it. They'll thank you for that because then they'll feel more confident talking to their biocompatibility expert about what the change means um, and you'll have more success. So as far as verbiage goes, we use you know, a lot of standard verbiage. Um, it, there's too much to really talk about it, um, but you want to kind of tell the story um, as, as precisely and, and succinctly as possible, um, but you still want to be able to tell the story. Okay. Oh, we just got one more. Um, have you known any company who has successfully used the draft guidance document select updates for biocompatibility of certain devices in contact with intact skin? This is from 2020 to avoid biocompatibility testing or reduce testing? Great question. I, I, and this, uh, I'm wondering if I might know the person who asked this, but um, so this is a draft guidance that came out in 2020. It, it basically, I love this. In fact, I did a, a webinar on this. It's called the, uh, the Naughty and Nice List, if you want to look it up. But um, the FDA lists a bunch of materials that they consider safe for skin contact. Um, and then they list a bunch of materials they consider not safe, but just not, not safe, but just you have to evaluate um, for skin contact. Um, and I love that whole concept. It's a risk-based approach. Um, I think it was great, well-written. I love using it. We use it a lot um, with mixed responses. So it really depends on the person you're doing. It is draft and the FDA will definitely always tell you it's a draft guidance document. They do not follow draft guidance. And that's true, but it's more than draft for me. It's the current thought process of the FDA. So it's it's what they're thinking about as far as a risk-based approach. So for us, we don't actually say you have to follow this because it's draft. What we'll say is, instead of we'll call it a draft, we'll say do uh, with the current thinking of the FDA to skin contacting based on their draft, we are going to follow the same suit. We're going to do the same kind of evaluation that you guys did in your draft to why this is safe. Uh, we've had some success with that. I'm not going to say it's 100%, uh, but it's it's definitely better than saying you wrote a draft, you got to follow it. It's more, this is the current thinking in your draft. We think it's great. We agree with this current thinking. So we're going to use it too. Um, do you do you agree to that thinking? Um, and that's been more successful for us. Okay. Well, we are coming right up on three o'clock. So I think we need to end it there. Thor, thank you so much for your time. This is a really important topic for so many of our clients. And they were great with the questions today. We were glad to have it. Uh, so I know the presentation is going to be valuable to our audience. Well, thank you for having me. I always love talking about these things and uh, enjoy spending time with you. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.